Hello, and welcome to another broadcast of Project CSK. I'm the creator of Project CSK, and the online name that I go by is DES. Today, I'll be continuing the development path that I've been doing for some time now, and I'll be adding more functionality like I always do. Hi, Hal Candy. Thanks for joining. Hope you enjoy the show today. And uh, that was a great question that you were asking me earlier about the Composite Collider. I do intend to uh, go back to that. And one of the things that I did, uh, actually, I'll get into that a bit later. But um, anyway, so I'm going to be uh, continuing the development path that uh, I've been doing for some time. And these videos, you know, you're welcome to interact with me during these videos. And if you don't catch them, that's okay too. I upload these videos to YouTube on my YouTube channel and you can follow all of those and uh, watch them uh, at your convenience at any time that you like, which is more convenient for some people. So whatever works for you um, works for me. Either way, it's okay. The idea of making these videos is to share the knowledge, right? I'm not an expert in the field, right? I do what I do because I enjoy doing this on my spare time. I like to make stuff. Most people do, right? Everybody has a passion towards something. And this is one of the things that I like to do, and that's to make stuff. It just happens to be games at this time. It's software engineering and technical things that I enjoy making. And I enjoy it for a number of reasons, but it's partly because of the learning process too, because I don't know this stuff. I just figure it out along the way. I didn't go to school to learn how to do this stuff. It's just stuff I just pick up over time because it's interesting. Who doesn't like to play video games in today's day and age with the uh, the new Xbox, the new PlayStation uh, around the corner? You know, everybody likes to play video games and it's not just one type of video game. That's the great thing about it is there's so many different types. There's something for everybody, right? Even my own mother plays video games, right? Probably not something I would ever play, but still, that's not the point. The point is that everybody likes to get enjoyment in some way, some form, or fashion. Video games just happens to be an interactive method of you get to interact with the game and the game world or the virtual environment within the game, right? And what's interesting with that is that there's so many different ways, there's so many different genres of gaming. And not only that, there's multiplayer games. Multiplayer games are more complex in many ways, yes, but they allow another level of communication far beyond that where users can interact with each other inside of a virtual world with set rules, boundaries, goals, interests, whatever the case may be. So it, the possibilities are really endless. And that's one of the great things I like about it. And I'm not saying that's the only thing I like about it. I could keep going on. The entire stream could be about me liking these types of things, but I don't think that would be that interesting to watch. So. A um, couple things, uh, of course, um, the Halloween event is still going on. Uh, the Halloween event will end on Friday, uh, Friday end of day, my time, uh, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, I will be um, shutting down the server and then disabling the event and bringing the event back on. That only really takes about five, 10 minutes to do, but that will be the end of the event. So if you haven't done the event yet or you're in the process of doing it, keep in mind that the event, the clock is ticking. So if you want to get those pumpkin pets or the rewards or whatever the case may be, or maybe you just like to collect candy, whatever it is, you know, enjoy it. But it's only going to be here for a little while longer. And once it's gone, that's it, right? And this is the last year likely that you'll be able to access the Flash Player client of the game, meaning once it gets shut down end of this year, that's it. It's up to the Unity version that I'm working on that you get to see me build will replace that in time. And we'll see how that goes. I don't know the full details yet at this time, but it's something that's definitely on my mind. And that's why I really want to get this Unity client version of it up and running so that users can still continue playing the game because the server is not getting shut down. The server is still going. Nothing's happening to the server. It's the client that's going to be unable to load in the browsers. And if it can't load in the browser, then you're not gonna be able to run it plain and simple, right? So, but the good thing too though, that comes from that is when the Flash client version shuts down, 
then I don't need to worry about or um, be concerned about uh, breaking the Flash client version. Because right now, everything that I'm doing is purely on the client side, on the Unity client version, which is cross-platform, yes, but um, I'm not modifying anything uh, core logic within the game server, adding new packets, uh, changing any logic in any way, shape, or form. Because if I do that, there's a high chance that that will break the Flash client version, and then I would have to go into the Flash client version and fix it. But if the Flash client version is obsolete and we're putting it completely behind us and we're moving forward with the Unity version, then I can safely go in and make any modifications that I want knowing that I don't need to worry about the Flash client version anymore because it's in the past. So there's definitely a good thing that comes from it. And for anybody who's tested it, the Unity version of it is so much better in performance. It's not even comparable. They're not in the same league. You're getting like 60 frames per second uh, and it's not even optimized, right? And you're getting it on a low-end system, whereas the Flash version on a modern-day desktop on a modern day desktop, on my desktop, I can barely keep the uh, frames per second at the maximum that it's set at, which is like, uh, I don't know, 30, 32 frames per second, right? I can't even keep a constant frame rate. So imagine how users are that have an older system that's not up to date or is not fully compatible with performance optimizations that Flash has done uh, some time ago. There's so many benefits. And not only that, but it's going to be cross-platform, which is one of those things I really like personally because I like the idea of being able to play on my desktop, okay, and then be like, you know, um, I want to go sit down or uh, and, and play on my tablet, right? I can go play on my tablet, right? And then after that, it's like, you know what? I want to be lazy. I want to go lie down on my bed, right? And you can take your phone or your tablet, whichever one you want, you can go lie down on the bed and you can still play the game. And that's one of the great things about it, right? Because it gives you that versatility. And not only that, it's touchscreen, mouse and keyboard, joystick on all devices, meaning any device that you have, you can connect a mouse and keyboard to your smartphone or your tablet. It'll still work the same. You can connect any joystick to the a uh, desktop version to a tablet uh, to Android. It doesn't matter if it's iOS, whatever. It'll still all work the same. There is going to be no differentiation in that way. So there's just so many advantages that comes from it that I'm really looking forward to. And not only that, there's going to be some really nice changes. I don't want to jump ahead and and get that kind of information out just quite yet. But there's, let's just say there's some things that have been in the works that I've really been trying and trying and trying to get to something that I would be happy with, but we're getting there. However slow it may be, any progress is good progress, right? And we're gonna continue to work forward and get to a point where you'll see this game become something that is really going to be uh, pretty awesome, in my opinion. And you'll get to see it. So for those of you who are here watching, thank you for watching. And I appreciate it because it's not just about sharing the knowledge. It's about bringing awareness. It's about interacting. It's just so many things about it, like especially building a community, right? Because this is the best method that there is for me to relay that information uh, to you as the viewers who are watching and interested because uh, there's no way I can put this much information and content in one of my blog posts or uh, do a newsletter email and spam it out to everybody. Nobody likes that. I know the second I get a newsletter, this, I'm hitting junk and then don't send it to me again. Done, right? That's why I don't do newsletters, right? Nobody wants them. But anyway, enough about that. So uh, moving on to the development, what I was thinking of doing is at uh, first I'm going to have a quick look and see where we kind of left it off last time. I think it was in a pretty good state last time when we were working on it. And um, I want to continue from there. 
And I have, of course, things that there are many, no short list, list of things that I need to do on my to-do list, and uh, we'll get going on the to-do list. <clears throat> So let's get into it and let's see where we were before and uh, we'll continue from there. So from what I remember, and uh, I keep trying to work on this on the weekend and I, I do, but like I do work on the project because I'm always working on it in some way, some form. But I, I mean, actually sitting down and developing, meaning uh, putting the time into putting uh, uh, programming and functionality into the game. It's just so hard to find time for that sometimes. It really is. With all the other things that I do for the project, uh, including research and development, communication, um, emails, forum, um, checking to make sure the server has no errors, it's not crashing, and the list just goes on and on. It, it's really challenging sometimes to make time. Let's run this thing and uh, see where it's at. Okay, and I will connect my joystick. So again, I like to test on my joystick. Any joystick really will work. It doesn't matter. As long as it's X input compatible, um, Unity is pretty good at picking up that uh, the communications that the joysticks do. So it makes it a lot easier for a developer using the new, in, new Unity input system versus the older version that they had. Uh, the new one, it, it does take a little while to get used to, to be honest, but once you get used to it, it's so much better. It's really a lot better. Oh, yeah. That looks nice. I like that. It's going to look so much nicer, too, in the future. Okay. And then, yeah, of course, I'm still getting stuck on corners, those invisible corners. You can see me zigzagging around, right? I'm zigzagging not because uh, I, I'm intentionally doing that. I'm zigzagging because I'm trying to get around those uh, invisible corners that my character keeps getting stuck on. Okay, so uh, we got our blocks. Yeah, I like that block. It, it's nice. That block is really nice. Looks good. Yeah, and then I get stuck on uh, that getting stuck thing. That's not fun. Really not cool at all. Uh, I wish it wasn't the case. Oh, uh, like I was saying, Hell Candy, um, at the beginning. Um, so I have looked into the composite collider thing a few times, but it just requires a lot of research and trial and error. What I even did is I made a uh, standalone application just to test that one functionality of the composite collider. But the thing is, though, so there's a certain point where it breaks. This, uh, and when I removed it, it's not in there now, but there's a certain point where it, it has that threshold. Once you go past that threshold, it stops behaving the way that it should. But anywhere before that threshold, it actually works exactly the way it's supposed to, which is what makes it that much more challenging because I have to find that threshold. And to figure out what that threshold is, I can't just make a simple prototype test to test it. No, I have to keep adding stuff and I have to keep adding more and more and more and more functionality and it has to be gradually done, right? So it's basically like rebuilding the project again, right? Or taking the project, making a completely different branch of it and then completely ripping it apart and piecing it back together, which it wasn't meant to be in that way, which makes it really time consuming to do. So that's that's kind of what I'm thinking is one of the one of my options that I'm considering is doing that and continuing with that. So I have a beta prototype of just that alone to test the composite collider. And previously, uh, after I, I removed the Composite Collider some time ago, which was in one of my uh, videos on YouTube, uh, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it is. Because I put uh, like a weekend, a whole weekend into it, and I did not get the result that I wanted. And if I put in a weekend, an entire weekend into it, 
and I make no progress with it, it's not exactly the best use of my time. I'm not saying it's a bad use of my time, but it doesn't give me the progress that I want, which means that I need to put a lot more time into it and a lot more troubleshooting. And to do that means that I'm taking time away from other aspects of the project that I could be working on or taking away from you know things in my personal life to make time for that one thing that's kind of a crutch in the project right now. So it's a pretty big deal. and. You know, it, it in the end, it could be something really minor, right? That maybe if I do something a certain way versus how I did it before, I may get a different result. Like, for example, the animation transitions that I did, uh, I figured out at a certain point that you can't enable and disable objects. What I mean by that is I can grab one of these objects. Let's see, I'll grab this one right here. And this is kind of what's happening is you enable and disable it, right? But if you disable an object and then you re-enable it right away, you cannot expect it to function the way that it should. You have to give it time to initialize. I didn't know that before, right? So because of that, I was building out all this functionality, including the transitions, and uh, the logic was failing. And I couldn't understand why is the logic failing? My logic, the, the calculations, everything was correct. I went over it again and again and again. And uh, eventually I, I came to the conclusion of, okay, so it's not my logic, right? Because if you test every single possible scenario you can, and then whatever that's left that you haven't tested is what you should be testing next, right? So it's, it just inevitably, inevitably led to that. And as I did testing, within a very short time, I found out that it wasn't my logic. And I wasted all this time because I didn't know that you can't uh, use a game object, especially a complex one, right after enabling it. So that means that I'm going to have to restructure uh, the logic in my object pool system as well, because the way my object pool system works is that when you use an object and you're done with it, you just deactivate it and you leave it right where it is, right? And then next time you need an object, you go to the object pool system and you say, give me an object of this type. And the object pool manager looks through the objects within the object pool and goes, oh, here you go. This one's the type that you want. Go ahead and use it, right? And then you take that object and you go activate it first. Uh, of course, you set the appropriate parameters and whatnot that you need to. You activate it and then you use it right away. And that's what I've been doing. And I've noticed weird behavior as a result of that. And it's starting to make more sense now. Now that I'm getting a better understanding of it, you can't just use an object, especially when you create a new instance of an object. <clears throat> when you uh, instantiate an object, like let's say a prefab, or if you're segmenting something together purely from code and you're uh, adding components and whatnot, you cannot use it right away. So it's the same or similar concept to activate and deactivate. And uh, it's a lesson I had to learn the hard way. And um, because of that, some of my logic is still um, not using that uh, the correct way, which has led to undesirable behavior. Uh, of course, I'll fix all of that now that I'm aware of it, but now that I'm aware of it, I'm thinking maybe that's possibly uh, a contributing factor to why the composite collider was not behaving the way that it should. Because under some very case-specific scenarios, the composite collider did behave uh, correctly, but majority of the cases, it did not. And those majority of the cases could be because of the way that I was using the objects, which was creating them right away or uh, activating and deactivating them right away, or sorry, uh, deactivating and then activating them right away and then using them. And then they were supposed to be added to the composite collider, which is what resulted in it failing to build the correct geometry and then I was doing calculations against the geometry. So it was layers of complications that could have potentially been avoided 
and can potentially be the cause of it. So um, next time I go and try to address the um, the composite collider to fix it, or try to fix it, should I say, that's definitely one of the things that I'm going to test. And I'm going to do some really strange tests this time around when I get to it. But anyway, so enough about that. Uh, let's get to the tasks at hand. Okay, I think this is working uh, well. The, the animations and the transitions, they look pretty good. So uh, some of the things on my list that I'd like to do, of course, I want to implement the camera. I, don't, I want to uh, implement the Cinemachine camera. I really like that camera system. And um, what I want to do is I want to use that, and I'm going to have to put in some logic for it to pick the right target to move around with. And then uh, once the camera goes in, then the, the environment won't be stuck like in the in the bottom left like that. Instead, the camera will focus your player character. So wherever your player character goes, there will be a nice transition of a smooth camera following it. And that way, it's irrelevant how big the game stage is, which is also going to be used, of course, in the world when we get to it at a later time. Um, so the camera is one of the things I want to do. But I think before I get to the camera, I want to um, do the animations. Because I did the other animations too. And what I'm thinking is I'll do the animations for the character. Because right now, um, when you move around, right, there is no animations. Right? Um, it, it's all the same state. There is no differentiation between the states. There's no KO animation. There's none of that stuff. So I think that's what I'll do next right now. Um, Hopefully it won't be too complicated, but um, that's uh, I think that's what I'm going to do next. So let's have a look at that and see um, what we got. Because I remember in the early prototype that I made some time ago, which was meant just purely as a prototype, I had the animations. Um, the flying animation should be priority. Um, yeah. It, 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 maybe no actually not really sorry uh, but it will get in there for sure um i'm a big fan of that animation myself the first time that i implemented it it didn't behave the way it was supposed to but it was still hilarious the way that it uh the way the animation went because you know when you first do something the logic doesn't quite behave the way that you think it should and you got to tweak it to make it work but it was really funny and then eventually when i got it working it, it was just really nice i like that animation okay so we need to go into characters default okay so i'm gonna deviate away from this method because this is the method from the old prototype. So it has, you can see all the animations. I'm going through them, right? So they're all broken up, and there's just way too many animations. I don't want that many frames. Not that it really matters, but if I'm going to implement this uh, i want to keep the number of frames of animations down because all that does is it bloats the overall file size of the project and i do want to be um, aware of that in the background because there's potentially going to be a lot of these character animations in the future and um, it adds up very quickly so the way that i want to do it i think is a one i don't want to have them broken up into their individual sprites i want to slice it within the application itself. So what I'll do is I'll go back to Flash and I'll export a sprite sheet. I'll put together a sprite sheet is kind of what I'm thinking for the animations. And then I'll use the sprite sheets and uh, I'll slice those up individually and bring them in. And then they all get added to the Atlas anyway. Um, the Atlas is something I should actually be aware of. Okay, so the Atlas is filling up. Um, you can see the Atlas ever so briefly in the bottom here. Let me do this if I can. So that's the Sprite Atlas, right? 
and look at how many of those animations are taken up from the sprite um, walk animation. That's a lot, right? That's a lot of space that's used for the sprite animations. And all these other uh, GUI elements too. There's a lot of redundancy stuff in here. I'll need to clean this up. The Sprite Atlas is something that's put together by Unity. And this is one of the newer features that, well, not that notes, but one of their newer features that they added that I really like. And it takes all your sprites, whether it's a sprite sheet, a single sprite, however many there may be, and it puts it into one image. And the reason why it does that is it reduces the number of draw calls. Draw calls consume a lot of performance, uh, especially on lower end devices, but even on higher end devices, they still consume a lot of performance. But by taking all of them and merging them into one single atlas, every single one of these is still individually addressable. And I can pull any one of them out of the atlas and use them just like how I would normally but this gives a significant performance boost on lower end devices and a reasonable performance boost on higher end devices. But I need to keep in mind how many objects go in here because once it hits capacity, then that's it, right? Then I need another Sprite Atlas. And this one is uh, 2048 by 2048, which is standard block size. You can increase it from 2048 to uh, 4096 or 8192, but then that makes it not compatible with older devices. Older Android devices and older smartphones, tablets and whatnot, their standard size of the maximum size that they can take for a texture uh, size like this is 2048 by 2048. So this is it until you need another one. But that's... um. So I need to keep that in mind. That's why I want to reduce the number of, oops, I didn't mean to do that. That's why I want to reduce the number of uh, objects that I put into there. So it stays optimum. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll need to open up Flash. And I'll just take a second. So just bear with me while I open that up. And this, uh, I don't think I'll be able to get this done in um, in one broadcast. So this will continue to my Friday and Saturday broadcasts. And if you miss them, that's okay. Um, I'm just going to upload them to YouTube like I always do, with a slight delay, of course, because it takes me a bit of time to um, encode and re-encode and do a quick edit and upload it. Okay, so you should be able to see this now. All right, so what I want is the sprite. Where did I? I thought I made a, uh, OK. Maybe I didn't. Oh. Huh. thought I did. Oh, there it is, right there. OK. So there's my animation. Um, there's the standing, of course, um, which is no animation at all. But there's the walking. So what I want to do is I want to take this and Let's see, how do I want to do it? <clears throat> Ideally, I would like it all to be inside of one, but then that means I would have to go into each one of these in these walk animations and pick individual keyframes. And I don't want to do that. So what I'll do instead is for for the short term, for for now, what I'm thinking is I will make five pieces. So one of them will be the standing, which will be the default. And then each one of the walk animations on all directions, they'll export as their own individual um, sheet. Yeah, I think that'll be better. Because then I'll be able to selectively just remove stuff from it. So the stand ones, I don't care. Uh, they'll be fine. So what I'll do is I will just create a standard 
yeah, I, I should probably do that now to, to start standardizing it. So what I want to do is I want to create a empty uh, movie clip. I'll use a primitive object. So what I like to do, of course, is I like to set the background to white and then set the transparency of that object uh, down to zero. That way, um, when you go to export it, it doesn't come up. But because it's it still exists, it's used as a boundary. So by pressing F8, I can make it into a sprite, or sorry, into a movie clip or object. I'm trying to think, how many do I need and how big do I need this to be? I think I'll need this to be probably 512. Um, 512, yeah. We'll go 512 by uh, 512. Right, so that uh, later on when I segment it uh, together, there'll be enough room for all of the stand animations, the walk animations, the KO animation, and all of the others within this 512 by 512. So then what I do, I select this, hit F8, and I'll give it a, uh, a name, which will be, uh, let's go with 512 uh, by 512. Sorry, you don't see this part. Um, Default, no, I'll say model. Model zero default. That makes sense, I think. Yeah, okay, I'll just go with it. All right, so, um, and then what I'll do is I will take these and I will cut those and put them in this object here temporarily. I'll make a new layer, of course, because I don't want to put it on the background layer. Okay, so that will go there. These will stay outside of that for now, just because um, I won't, I don't want to modify them in that fashion right now. But now that I have this at 512 by 512, so the, that will be my grid, which you should see. Yeah, okay, green is a good color. Okay, and then we have the players on top. So the, let's see, I think this one is down. Yeah, so we got uh, down, we got, down, left, up, and right. Okay. So we'll go uh, down, right, up, left, right? Roughly. Okay. Um, so what I'll need to do is I'll need to slice this accordingly. Because it's 512 by 512, uh, there's quite a bit of room. But at the same time, I need to keep in mind the limitations that I should be following, or the general rules, which is the power of two, meaning uh, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 512, right? Most of the time, I don't follow that because that's a really old rule to follow. And most modern um, hardware doesn't have that limitation anymore. Um, but uh, some systems, I believe, still do. Don't quote me on that. I think I might be wrong on that. But anyway, so let's see. What kind of grid do we need for these right now? So this guy, if I give him, and I want to leave some space for uh, future character models to, to follow the same suit, right? The same kind of... Um, groundwork that I'm setting right now. So what I can do is I can go width of 64 and then height of 128, right? That gives me a lot of space. Let's see if I do that. Oh, I put it on the wrong layer. Uh, okay, that's why. So I'll take that and I'll put it on this layer. Sorry, I got the layers mixed up. Okay, orange, you should still be able to see orange. Orange is not as good color. 
Let's go with a different color for that layer. Okay. So that's going to be the boundary for each one of these. And I want to snap that. Why isn't it snapping? Oh, okay. One of the reasons why I like working inside of Flash is because you can snap objects fairly well, especially objects that have boundaries. Okay, so that's a perfect position. Okay, and I'm going to follow with that logic um, for the rest of them. So this character will fit roughly in this area which means there's plenty of room for growth for future characters, right? To have, um, there's quite a bit for the left, for the right, for the bottom, and for above height-wise as well. Even though it may not need to be used, and in the future I might revisit this and change the, the structuring of it, but for right now, I think it's a, a general rule that I can follow that should work um, fairly well. So I'll just continue with that logic for now. Why is this not snapping? I don't get it. I want you to snap. Okay. Snap. There we go. That's what I wanted. Okay. Now that I have three, I should be able to copy and duplicate them. That way, it's just a little bit faster. Right? And then the one on the end, I'll remove it. And I'll take all of them, copy and paste it. Right? And that'll snap, and then I'll copy the whole thing, paste it, and then snap that. So there's my grid, right? Once you get the initial blocks going, it builds out quite a bit faster. Okay, so I want to leave that as my guide, okay? And then now I need to find an appropriate position for the character. And because the character has an anchor point, each, whoops, didn't mean to go into it. Uh, each one of them have an anchor point. I'm going to use the anchor point for positioning, which makes it easier for me to slice it later when I bring it into Unity, and then I'll apply the same anchor point, which means my positioning and my Y sort that I'll be doing will all line up exactly the same way. So this one right here, I want the, let's see, how would that logic work? I want it to be... because I want it to be in the correct position. So the correct position for this one on the X would be minus 32. So that would give you the correct position. And then on the Y, it would be, I can't do math right now. Okay, I need the calculator. Where's the calculator? Good old calculator. Okay, so it will be um, this and then plus. Oh, okay. So it, it needs to be 160 or minus 160 in this case. Yep, that looks right. Okay, so if it's minus 160, then the others will use the same Y position. And this is one of the things that I personally, and I'm not trying to put flash down, but whoever designed this thing made a mistake. Y, X, Y, the Cartesian coordinate system needs to be a standard across, across all applications. Flash is one of the very few that will use Y negative value to go up and positive value to go down. 
Everything else, including the math you learn in school, y goes up, right? Positive y goes up, negative y goes down. The same as x, right? Negative x goes to the left, positive x goes to the right. But flash does that in reverse. What do I mean by that? Like, look at this guy right here. So I'll go to y0, right? So there's y0, okay? But let's say I wanted to move him up. So you'd think, oh, okay, so just change y to 100. But where did he go? He went down. He didn't go up. If I want him to go up, I need to go y minus 100 goes up, right? And this is, in my opinion, one of the decisions that Adobe has made that I do not agree with personally. Positive value should go up, negative value should go down, and it should be a standard. Okay, but anyway, so all of these are gonna have the same Y because they're on the same Y plane, but their X is gonna vary. So because this one was 160, I need to I need to bring out the calculator again. Okay, so it would be 160 and then it would be plus 64. Does that make sense? So it'd be 224. Wait, no, it's, oops, that's why I use a calculator. Okay, so it's at, this one is at minus 32. That means the next one over is going to be whatever this value is on this one, and then minus 64. So 32 plus 64 equals 96, of course. So this needs to be x of minus 96. Right, so that gives it a perfect positioning. And the next one, again, same thing. So this one will be uh, 160 minus 160. And then this one will be 224. So it'll be minus 224, right? So that's perfect positioning. <clears throat> And the reason why I do this um, is both for um, ease. Uh, so there's padding. That would take time to get used to. Yeah. Yes, it would. Um, but it also makes it easier to slice. When I bring it in uh, Unity, because Unity has the functionality where you bring in a sprite like this or a sprite sheet, and you can say slice by cell size. And if I just tell it my cell sizes are width of 64, height of 128, it automatically slices all of them. So it doesn't matter how many there is, it'll just slice them all. And this has a fair bit of room for growth, which is perfect, because then I, I can still add some more stuff. So that one is ready to go. So then it's just a matter of these. The walk animations, what I want to do is I want to first line them up correctly. I believe this one is right. This one is, I don't know which one is down and which one is up. But this one's clearly left. I'll need to look at this and see. That looks like the down animation. Yeah. And then that one is the up animation. Okay. So up, I believe, was this one. Down was this one. Okay. So now that I have them in their positions, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so this one I can export at any time, but these ones, what I want to do is I want to reduce the number of frames because I don't want 40 frames, uh, which is what results in all that space being uh, occupied by the Atlas, which you've seen. I, I don't want that many frames. I don't need that many frames. Right? So we're going to reduce this by quite a bit, actually. So let's take a chunk out. Where's, oh, I need to um, edit multiple frames. OK. And then if I select, come on. 
I select that to, oops. And then I should be able to go Shift F5, I think. Oh yeah, okay. So Shift F5. And I'll just take out pieces. Actually, I'll probably take out a lot more than that. Because I only really need about six frames of walk animation. Yeah. Because I really want to reduce it for file size. Because if you multiply that by the number of characters that can potentially be in the game, that is a lot of graphics. So all I'm doing is I'm just removing these um, these transitions first, just to kind of have a look at it. Okay. That looks pretty good. But still, that's that's too many frames. I don't want that many frames. I want less frames. I really do want to bring it down. But if I bring it down, because right now it's eight frames. In here, it doesn't look that good, but later when it's properly animated and there's proper sprites, the animations will look significantly better than this. Um, do I want to bring it down? I think I do want to drop it. So if I take that down and I remove those, all the duplicate frames are gone, or all the transitions are gone. So this is what the animation, walk animation looks like. I don't know how that got in there. I think that looks decent-ish. Yeah, and that brings it right down to about that position of five frames. That's kind of what I want, because I, I don't want that many. I don't want 40 frames per walk animation cycle. It's just way too much. So that'll make it easier on this one as well. I'll just remove all of those. I think that looks okay. And these are some of the decisions that you have to make when you're when you're developing a game, right? Um, because these decisions, they can have significant effects in the long term. Like, yes, it's nice to have smooth animations, but is it worth it for what the side effect is that it brings? Like to do that many frames of animation when it's done in a tweening fashion like this, which is transitioning piece by piece, it's not a big deal, not at all, right? But if you wanna do it on, let's say, um, a frame by frame animation and you wanna give it to an artist and you tell them, oh, hey, so uh, I'd like for you to do this animation in 40 frames. They'll say, oh, okay, you want 40 frames for all four directions, jump animation, flip animation, die animation, uh, sit down animation, uh, roll over animation. You want it all done in 40 frames? I can do that. And then you look at them in the face and you say, no, I actually meant I want you to do a 40 frame animation for one single walk direction and then multiply that by four directions. They're not going to be happy about it. They will not be happy about that. I mean, sure, sometimes it's justified to do things like that, but on, on a game like this, the, uh, the benefits far outweigh uh, the other detrimental things that it can potentially bring. And one of the biggest ones being file size, right? Let's say we only have five characters in the game. 
no problem. You can easily do some really smooth, slick animations that could be 128 frames if you really wanted to, right? But then as soon as you multiply that to, let's say, 10 characters, your frames and uh, number of animations needed is going to go up a lot. And then you multiply it again, and let's say you want it to have 100 characters, 200 characters, the number of frames that are going to be needed just for the walk cycle animation it will be more than the entire project combined times 10. Okay, so that's my animations. What I'm going to do is these need a boundary. I forgot. So what I'll do is I'll go into this one. I'll grab that one boundary that I made, which is a 128 by 64 boundary, and I'll apply it to each one of these. This has a boundary? Oh, it does have a boundary. It's just old. Okay. So what I'll do is I will paste that. Where did it go? Uh oh. Oh, it went up there. Why did it go up there? I don't know. Okay. So we'll just center it. Oh, I can't center it. I will need to offset. Uh, I will need to Y offset it by 32, I believe. So instead of minus 64, it'll be minus 32. No. See, this is why I get it confused. When you have uh, Y being opposite in one app, application and then being the other direction in another application. Yeah. Okay. So it'll be 96. Wait, is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. Okay. So that's going to be the new bound. I will remove the old one. Okay. So that'll kind of make it line up similar to how the other one was. Right? And then of course, once I get this into the, um, the game, I'm gonna delete all of the other ones out because I, I don't want them in there. They just occupy space in the Sprite Atlas that I'm gonna be using. So I'll paste the same. And uh, One of the nice things uh, inside of Flash is uh, some applications, not all, but some applications, if you copy something, you can go Control Shift V. And by pressing Control Shift V, it's slightly different than uh, Control V. So if you go Control C is copy, Control V is paste. But if you go Control Shift V on the paste, it'll preserve all the properties and it'll put it into the exact same location. And I like that. Some applications do that, some don't. But that's what I'm doing. So I'm just selecting the old uh, boundary, removing it, and then control shift V, and it goes right into the perfect spot it's supposed to go into. Okay, and then same thing, control shift V, and then that's it. Okay, so I think uh, these are ready for exporting. Um, do I need to name them? Let's see what their names are. Okay, model fill walk left. Yeah, I, I need to rename these. I'll need to follow a standard naming convention. So um, what I will do is I will say uh, 120, wait, no, you go width first, then height. So it's uh, 64. Uh, 64 by 128, 128, it is uh, model zero underscore uh, walk down. 
right? And then I'll just copy that. This one, right click and say show in library. That's one of the things I also like is it just takes you right to where the reference of it is. Even if it's the same folder, that's okay. So this one is walk right. So I'll just change down to, oops, I'll change down to right. This one will likely be in the same location. Yep. Okay. Oops. Nope. Don't want that. So this one will be the up. And the reason why I'm saying model zero is because this is the default model. Model zero, the default model is ID number zero. And every single one of them as well is referenced by an ID. Yes, I named them in the game, in the Flash version, and I will continue to use a naming convention, but that naming convention uh, of giving it a name like the baby cake berserker or something like that, that's not a unique identifiable uh, ID that I use for selecting the model. It's the ID that's used, right? And this one is ID number zero. Okay, these are ready for export. So what I will do is I will export them into my... Okay, I don't want to export there. Okay. So I will right click and go um, export PNG sequence, even though it's not a sequence, this one is just one. I just wanted to preserve the name. Right? Yeah. Okay, 512 by 512, that's correct. Usually I like to look at them after I export them, just in case there's Oh, I forgot, and that's why I test it. So I'll need to right-click and re-export it again. I forgot to export with uh, transparent background. It, it was came out only as 24-bit. It should have came with 24-bit with transparency or 32-bit. 32-bit meaning, of course, it has transparency because it goes RGB and then A afterwards. So I wanted to go uh, export PNG sequence. And one of the things that I kind of dislike about this, um, in my opinion, is because um, when you export, um, there's a padding that Flash incorporates into it, which I'm not a big fan of. Meaning the individual space in between the sprites, um, they get a padding. Sometimes it's one pixel, sometimes it's half a pixel. So that requires uh, a fine tuning when you bring it into um, Unity. Uh, I, I would prefer not to have to do that. And I don't know why uh, that happens, but it's just one of those bizarre behaviors. Okay, so that's a good export. And then this one, uh, same thing. I'll go uh, export PNG sequence. Or is it sprite sheet? I think it's sprite sheet. I think it's sprite sheet. Let's try it and see. Oh, I forgot to, I forgot to name it when I exported it. My bad. Okay, I need to be mindful of that. Because I was wondering what happened. I couldn't find it after I exported it because I didn't name it. If you don't name it, it defaults to the same name of your project flash file, which is Candy Sugar Kingdom. And then it adds a PNG at the end of it, which is not very helpful. Because if you have another one that's exported as the same thing, it overwrites that one. And I don't want that, of course, that's undesirable behavior. Sorry, I'm just still trying to correct my previous mistake here. Okay, now that's named correctly. Okay, that looks better. 
And you'll see all of these when I bring them into Unity and I start slicing them. Because by doing all this prep work at this time, it just makes it that much easier um, when you bring it into Unity because it makes it so much easier to just slice it, put anchor points, and just start using it because it's ready to go almost right away. This is the prep work part that takes time. Okay, this one I'll right click, show in library. Just want the name of the file. So then when I right click and I say uh, generate sprite sheet, I can just paste the name into it and I don't need to worry about what happened before. Okay, two more to go. So show in library. Okay, right click, generate sprite sheet. Okay, and then one more. Show in library. Generate sprite sheet. Okay, so that should be it. I'll just save that because I want to save it in, in case I want to modify it again in the future. I'll move that out of the way. Okay, now we need to bring it into uh, Unity and slice it up. Okay, so what I'll do is I will see i should probably structure these at this point if i haven't done so already oh i kind of have so i have characters and then i have default okay well that's good i, I can work with that so characters i will create because that's the default one that's the old one that i'm going to remove uh what i'll do is i'll create a folder uh folder and i'll just call it zero because i know exactly what that means it's character zero of course um, what I want to do is uh, show and explore. Sorry, you don't see this part, but you will very soon, as soon as I bring it in. Okay, and I'm just going to grab all those that I exported. Where, where did it go? Okay, there's that, and then there's, where's the other piece? Oh, there it is, okay, I see. I see what happened. I'm okay with that, you'll see what I mean. Okay, it's just the naming convention. So I had a little bit of difficulties finding it because I, I used the, uh, the dimensions at the start of it, and some of them are six, 64 by 128, while the other one was 512 by 512, but that's okay. So the reason why I did all that prep work is because, well, I can go into here and I can just slice them that easily. But before I do that, what I want to do is I want to select these ones and I want to tell um, Unity that these are a maximum of 128 by 128, or are they? No. Wait, what's their size? I should probably know that, if I'm going to set that. So their maximum size will be 512. Okay, so everything is 512 by 512 then. And this is important. This is an important setting to set because of performance reasons. I don't know the full details of it, but everywhere that I've read, you want to set the maximum size, okay? And then, um, of course, uh, they're not singles, they're multiple. So I basically set the max size. I don't mess with algorithm, um, resize algorithm or formatting. I only do that if I see it doesn't quite work the way that I want it to. Same with clamping and filter mode. I don't usually change those, okay? But now that they're in, so there's this one that I did. I can just go into the drop down menu here, sprite editor, sorry, in, in slice, and I can say instead of automatic, uh, by uh, cell size. And by cell size, I just put in 64 by 128, and I tell it to slice. And it does a perfect slice, and that's what I want. 
I'll need to set the anchor points, but that's okay. I'll set the anchor points soon. But same thing with the others. Apply. Oh, yeah, of course. Apply. Apply. Okay, so here's where you may notice that one pixel or half a pixel offset that flash does. So these ones are, again, same idea. So I should be able to go slice 164 by 128. And then when I slice it, oh, it didn't do it that time. Cool. No, it did. This guy is a bit to the right. So is this one. And that one. And that one. And that one. Okay, so they're all one pixel to the right too much. And I know this because if I go in and I select one of these and I move their uh, center position, so this is their pivot point or their anchor position, what I do is I change it from uh, instead of uh, the default, which is center, I set it to custom. Right, And by setting it to custom, I should be able to set the unit I wanted in pixels, of course. So I should be able to set it uh, six, no, not 16, 32 by 32, because X goes uh, to the right and then Y goes up. And by setting it at 32 by 32, look at where that anchor point is, right? It shouldn't be that far off to the left. It should actually be in the center point right there between the feet. So that's how I know that um, they're offset. Because that's not how it should be. But I mean, most users don't notice that kind of details anyway. But of course, I do. So units, I'll leave the same. Custom, again, same thing. So it'll be 32 by 32. Where's my two? Weird. There's delay on it. Okay, but there's a faster way of doing this. And that's what I should be doing, actually. I will apply, apply. So this trick I didn't learn for the longest time. You can be in here, and if they're all the same size, you could sit here and do it manually. And I, I came across this because a long time ago, I needed to um, set the anchor position to a whole bunch of them. And I saw that I had like, I don't know, 50 or something sprites. I didn't want to set the same anchor position repeatedly again. So here's what you do. You just select it. And once it's been sliced, uh, that's all you need is for it to be sliced. You want to select the drop down so it shows all of them. Select all of them. And you should be able to, wait, where's that option? There's an option. Where did it go? Is it only available on singles? I hope not. I remember it was somewhere in this area where you could set the anchor position and other settings of multiple sprites all at the same time. I don't see it. It's very strange. That's unfortunate. Here I am trying to tell you a nice feature to use, but I can't find it myself. Where is it? I don't know where it went. I could have sworn it was in this area here. OK, whatever. I'll just do it manually, even though I was going to try to show you a, a nicer way of doing it. But still, I'll do it manually, whatever. So it'll be 32 by 32. That one, same idea. Custom, 32, 32. Same thing. Instead of center, custom, 32 by 32. And then apply the settings, of course. Okay, And you always want to check after you set it, because that blue circle shows exactly where your anchor position is. Anchor position is important because I Y sort everything like most games do. And um, it's by having a proper Y sort, uh, you're able to put one object behind or in front of something else. Okay, so same idea to this one. Um, sprite multiple, and then I want to, whoops. 
I want to slice. Okay, so the slicing is good. Custom pixel, say 32 by 32. Center custom, 32 by 32. So I'll be doing this, of course, for all of them. And then once these are done, then that means the prep work inside of Unity has been done as well. And this is important too. It's important to, to have these be uh, mathematically accurate. Uh, and I use, uh, I go down to the pixel usually just because I like to have that kind of uh, accuracy and detail. And then I'll slice this one. And by doing the prep work inside of Flash is what allowed this to be this easy. Otherwise, you're sitting in here trying to um, do all these uh, calculations. If you have weird shaped graphics, like what I mean by that is the bounding boxes of the boundaries of each sprite can potentially be different for each model. One can be a little bit wider, one can be a little bit taller, one can be a little bit shorter, right? But if you have these bounding bo boxes that you've done the prep work for beforehand and you bring it in, it just makes it that much more easier for you. <clears throat> okay, so that's that one. Two more to go, and then we'll uh, we'll be able to actually use them. Okay, slice. So same thing, all I'm doing is I'm just setting the, the pivot position or anchor position, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so one more for this one, and then this one's done, and then there's one last image that I need to do which is the standing, yes. Okay, so this will be the last one that I need to do and then I'll be able to use it. Almost there, one more. Okay. That looks good. So when I use this, that'll be significantly less images than the other, because the other one, if we look at it, characters default, look at how many images that is. That is a lot of images. And I don't want that. Th that should be like, you know, four or five characters or more four or five characters, no, like eight characters worth of images right there. That's a lot, right? So we want to be uh, conservative to a degree with that. Okay, so now let's, um, let's start building it out. What we need is, um, of course, to go back to the prefab of the character model, because I'm going to remove uh, all of these images, and what that'll do is it'll break it it'll break the existing um, whatever that's using it. And the reason why I say that is because the old prototype, which had movement in there too, is still in here somewhere. And I've, if I can salvage it, I'll probably use that because I think it still has a state machine that's relevant. So I won't need to redo that part. I'll, I can just reuse it by swapping out the graphics and the animations appropriately. And then in the future, when I have more characters, what I'll do is a similar idea to what I did with the environment animations. I'll use an animator controller override. I know that's a lot of words to just keep throwing around, but animation controller override is really good. It, it lets you keep the same state machine. So the logic stays the same, but all you're doing is just replacing the animations and it's just called an override. Override is actually a term that's used fairly often. Uh, 
in uh, programming as well, I do override functions once in a while because I find uh, when there's a need for it, it's it's really powerful tool. But when you don't need it, you don't really need it. Okay. So I need to find, actually, what I need to do is I need to go into my, I need to go into my test scene. That's what I want. So we'll go scenes, game room. Here's my good old test scene. What I'll do is I'll go to the testing of, no, I don't want that. Where is it? Game room, test. I think I have a character model in here. Yeah, I do. Okay. So there's my character model. And that I believe uses the prefab model. So if I right click on this and say prefab, uh, select asset, meaning show me where it is. Yeah, that's my, my prefab. Okay, so I'm going to break this to fix it. So it has a character model. Um, does it have an animator? It doesn't look like it has an animator. Okay, let's right click on this and go prefab and select um, open asset in isolation because I want to just keep it uh, separate from the rest to a degree. And I want to look through the nesting structure and see does it have an animator? Okay, so there is an animator. The animator is nested down in the structure tree. And it's the player animator. So why, why has it not been playing the animations if the animator exists? So this is all from the old prototype. I haven't touched this logic in some time or any of these graphics. Because this animator exists. So if I go to animator here, yeah. So we have idle and we have movement. Is that right? Oh, OK. So it is a state machine. OK. Yeah. That's right. I thought it would be a different uh, graphic if, if it's nested like that. So the way that this is, is that it uses a blend tree. Blend tree means depending on what condition, it'll play the different animation. So if the condition, let's see if I select this and I can move this, if you play um, or if you move it, so this would be the input that the user gives, whether it's uh, it could be joystick, it could be a touchscreen input, it could be um, arrows, it could be WASD. So let's say you press the arrow right, it'll go to the right here. And because it goes to the right, um, it'll play the right animation because of the way the logic of the state machine is. And th if you press the up, it'll play the up animation, left and down. And you can see this changing in the bottom here. It's not animating because it's not walking. But um, that's the idea behind it, is that it blends between these uh, conditions, which makes it a lot easier so then you don't have to code it yourself. This is a really powerful tool. And uh, everybody like in game development, this is what you use for movement. You use a blend tree or you use a, uh, what's it, the other one called? Uh, a substate machine. Right, uh, so a blend tree, substate machine, uh, those are the most common ways of taking something really complex and s simplifying it to its logical core and putting in an elegant solution that achieves exactly what you want. And not only that, it's also scalable for future so you can extend its functionality to do a lot more. My question right now is why is this um, not animating because this should be um this should have been animating the whole time let's run it and see 
So I'll just hit Control P to run it. And I want to see if, if movement is active. Because if movement is active, animations should be active. Oops, wrong focus. Okay, movement is not active, but if I select it, character model, um, okay, a user controlled, yes. Let's see, is that move it? Okay, so that, that gives movement, but the, okay. Let's activate that first. So we'll go into the character model and we'll say is user controlled. So that way when I run it and I'll test it again real quick, the arrow directions should uh, move it. Really? Okay, I missed something. Character model, user control. Oh, I have it in two, oh, right, okay. I meant to fix that. I just never got around to it. Okay, so I need to set it in two locations. Okay, so this is taking input, which is correct. So it'll take any type of input. It doesn't matter if it's touchscreen, WASD, or joystick. So if it takes input, then that means uh, it has an animator. So I'm not setting the values. I'm not pushing them to the animator. That's what I'm not doing, I think. Let's find out. <clears throat> Excuse me. OK, so what I need to do is I need to look at my Input movement control. Mm, I don't know about that. I think it's this one. Okay, so character model. That makes more sense. Okay. Right, so I'm not using it. Simply put, that's why. So there's no reference to the animator being used. There's no passing in of the values. OK, but I don't think this is the right location to pass it in, because I have a class specifically for movement input. OK, I'll bring that over here onto this side. I didn't move. OK. OK, so this class, I think, yeah. This class is the one that captures user input. Everything focuses into this. So it makes sense because the values are going to be here instead of recapturing all of those values again at a later time since the logic of movement is also here it funnels into this area and then the logic of movement gets sent from here to the server through the tcp ip socket connection i think does it not no, there it is, right there. OK, so this is where I send it to the server. OK, so all the right logic is there. Even though this isn't really an animator class, what I'm thinking is I'll put the, the input values and a reference to the animator here just for the input directions. But for, like, let's say, the KO animation or things of that sort, um, I'll have another reference to the animator and have that at the appropriate locations. But because these values, everything that I need is in this area, I'm going to put it in here so the animation should work. And it'll still have the old animations for the time being, and I'll change that because uh, I want to get rid of the old ones. So we'll say serialized field, 
because I want to expose it. Private uh, animator, Anim animator, animation, no, animator, yeah. And I'll call it underscore animator, right? So by making a serialized field, all it does is it just exposes it so I can drag and drop it into here. Give Unity a sec to catch up. Okay, and there's my animator right there. So what I need to do is move, I should be not doing this here. So I'll right click on it, go prefab, open asset in context, meaning that it's similar to open in isolation, but it grays everything else out this way. When I'm setting references, I'm setting the right references and I'm not setting the incorrect references. Because if you're setting references outside of uh, here, you can potentially have a reference that is um, not bound correctly in the way that you want. So you want to always set references when working within the prefab itself. This is the best way of setting references so you don't accidentally make a mistake, which I've done countless times myself. So I just follow this standard that others have set before me, and I think it's a pretty good standard to follow. Okay, all I need to do is I need to set the animator. The animator is on the model. Yeah, so I want the animator, which is on the model, and I want to drag that onto this here. So I can just drag model, and it'll automatically select the animator into, oh, where did it go? Right there. And it'll automatically grab the right reference because it knows what it's looking for. It's looking for the animator. Okay, now we have animator. I should be able to set the values because animator, no, I don't want to go 3D. I want to stay 2D. So it has speed, it has horizontal, and it has vertical. Right? Okay, I can do that. Okay, so I need to differentiate between the logic of when the user is standing still and when the user is... Hmm. Okay, so here's the zero value. So if this is zero value, uh, what we'd set is underscore animator dot set um, float. And uh, I want to set the value of that string, which is horizontal. Oops. And I want to set it to the value of uh, 0f. 0f meaning no movement. I'll, I'll just hit Control D. Oops, that's not Control D. Control D, duplicate the line. And I'll just change horizontal to vertical, right? And then if he's not moving, again, I'll hit Control D and I'll change speed as well, right? So in this point, the reason why I'm doing that, because based on the notes that I have, and that's why it's really important to have good notes in your code, um, at this point, if everything is zero, I have it right here, that if everything is zero, then that means there, there is zero movement. If there's zero movement, then that means the player is not moving horizontally, vertically, and the speed is going to be zero as well. Right? Yes. Okay. So that'll be my stop. That means I also need to set one for movement. So the movement one will be if movement current not equal vector to zero, then yeah, I think this is the right location because I'm setting uh, active direction. Okay, so here's my other one. But what I'm going to set is uh, input movement current and input movement current, I believe is a vector two. Yeah, perfect. So it, it is a vector two. That means by having it as a vector two, I'll be able to set I will set um, value of horizontal will be input movement 
uh, current, which is a vector two dot x. X would be the horizontal, and then y would be the uh, vertical. So, oh, whoops. So it'll be um, input movement current dot y for the vertical, and then for the um, the value of the movement speed. I don't think I really need that. But if I have speed, I should use it. I see a speed value. I do have speed. So I'll just pass in value speed. So that'll just be underscore speed. I could have alternatively, oops, it's move speed. I could have alternatively put in a value of 1F, meaning that movement is active. Um, but I think it makes more sense to just do it this way. Okay, so uh, with those values set, I'll go back out of isolation mode. And if I run this, in theory, we should see um, animations. Huh. So there's my down, and none of the others work. That's awesome. And that's why we test things, right? So it looks like down is active for whatever reason, right? Let's go into here and see what's going on with the down. So it's continuously saying move speed 1.5. Oh, move speed is speed, not, oh, my mistake. I, I messed up. That's not what I want. That's the wrong speed value to use. I think speed is just yes or no, zero or one. Yeah, I think I'll just go with value of one F. Oh, I just put all of those values in the wrong location. Let's pretend I didn't do that. So we'll just take this, put that here, take this, put that up here. Nobody saw that, right? Okay, cool. Glad we didn't have this conversation. Okay, and then speed will need to be, is it 1F? I don't know. Okay, let's run it again. I just want to see uh, what, that ha what happens this time as a result. Okay. Run. Oh, okay. So it is working. Okay. And here's uh, the thing I want to show you is the state machine. So if you look at this, these values will change. So the horizontal and vertical values, they will all change appropriately. So if you pay attention to this and you'll see when I move right, you see the horizontal value, this one here, it moves to the right, right? And by it moving to the right, uh, it plays the right animation. Right? As soon as I let it go, the value is back down to, to zero. But if I press left, the horizontal value is minus one, so it moves to the left. And then up is positive one, and down is negative one. And it plays each one. And you can see it's kind of faint. You can't see it that well. But these do gray out and highlight as well. So it looks fairly accurate. But by the looks of it, though, the when I let go, it keeps on snapping down to the down face where facing position, I think, instead of staying at the default position of where it was supposed to be at. <clears throat> and the reason 
for that is what is the reason for that? Because when it goes into the animation and it plays animation, when nothing is active, it'll go back up to the idle and the idle also has a logical tree. I'm not exactly sure. Is it these settings potentially? Let's have a look. Fixed duration, I will take that out and see if that's the culprit. Because it seems like there's multiple things that are going on here that are undesirable. One of them being the animation goes longer than it should. Like for example, I'll run it. And when I press right and let go, so I'm letting go, but it's still playing the animation for some time. And you can see it from jumping from state to state, from movement to idle. And right now it's on the idle, but it's for some reason, uh, it keeps defaulting to the bottom of facing animation. So when it's active, but I'm letting go and there's a delay. Uh, you don't quite see that, but I'm just tapping the button. However, you can see the character is still moving. Like all I'm doing is tapping and letting go, but look at how long it's playing that animation for. So I'm pressing and letting go instantly, but you can still see the walk animation plays for a good like half a second. That's not what I'm doing. If I was holding it for that long, it should be moving uh, or I should be moving. So the, the move, and the animation are not properly in sync. So there's multiple things going on here. What could be causing that? Okay, so from entry, goes into that, that's correct. Any state we're not using, exit we're not using. So that goes to the idle state. Idle. Hmm. Okay, so those look correct. Is it the animations themselves? Do I have them looping? I wonder. Or is it my code logic? It's a good question. It could be my code logic. Let's see. So check user input is on the fixed update. That's correct. If it is not user controlled, take no input, no action. None of this logic happens. Okay, But if it is, you get the character model component. If the player user does not exist in it, exit. <clears throat> So then it checks again if character model player user dot input allowed equals false. I, I really need to change that at some point, and I will. I have basically two checks for input. I only need one, but that's okay. And then I it goes to the controller, so the input, the new Unity input system, and it checks for a uh, gamepad left stick movement input, which would be WASD and arrows, I think. It also checks for on-screen controls. 
So it does a conditional logic check to see uh, which one is currently active and whichever one is active, it'll use the values from that one, which is all correct. If movement input equals previous movement and if movement equals zero, then return. Okay, so that means that if, if you're not providing any input, then it'll play through once through this iteration of the fixed update loop. But then the second time it comes to here and it checks again and you still haven't provided any input, there's no input change, it will not proceed. So it optimizes uh, to a degree. There's probably some other reason as well, but that's kind of what I see right now. So it just goes to this point and then it'll exit out. So it doesn't get to this point. But if it gets to this point, what it does is it takes the rigid body 2D, of course, uh, position, uh, plus movement, plus uh, movement speed uh, times uh, time dot delta time, of course, which is what allows it to have that nice smooth animation. So Naloth streaming in 4K, the code is like tiny. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, it is, uh, it is tiny. But this is just how I develop, and this is how I've been developing for a long time, and I narrate through it. So I hope that that helps uh, alleviate uh, how tiny the code is, because this isn't necessarily meant to be a full-on tutorial of how to program. There's a million other people that do that. What I'm trying to do is just share the experience of it and share the process of it and the logic that goes behind it. And I narrate through it and I explain it. Uh, I like to think to a fairly reasonable and acceptable uh, degree so that the users get a better understanding of it. And then Hell Candy, you mentioned, could it be a transition duration? transition duration that's possible i'll look into it sorry i i completely forget that there's a chat when i'm focused on what i'm doing i i completely forget i'm sorry about that guys um okay so then it checks for directions and then directions needs to be set And then in the other one, it checks validate and send position to server. Yeah, I'm not, there's no need to go there. So what could it be that's causing that? Let's, let's debug some output here because the stop should be an instant stop. This one here. So I'll say uh, debug.log because I think that's part of it. It's a contributing factor. So I'll say uh, model stopped. So, and the reason why I'm doing this is just to see that at the exact second that I let it go, or should I say the millisecond that I let it go, does the animation stop? Okay. So model is stopped. Okay, that was that was not a good test. I'm getting a million outputs. Okay, not a good test. Worth a try, but not a good test. Okay. Hmm. Could it be the transition duration? The transition duration itself can be interrupted at any time. So let me illustrate. We'll go into here and we'll go into one of the animations of the character model. Oh. So any one of these, let's say you're um, walking right that's the idle, um, no, I want walking 
we'll say right, for example. So let's say you're walking to the right. At any point, the animation can be stopped and you can exit out of it. So that's not tied to anything. Um, so it, it couldn't be the, the duration of the walk animation because the walk animation could be interrupted at any time. I think it's my code logic somewhere. Or actually, let's have a look at these. Oh, they're on loop. They're on loop. They should not be on loop. OK, I think that might be it. Um, can I do multiple at once? No. I think that's it right there, is I didn't uncheck loop. Because you don't want an animation to loop unless you want it to loop. Maybe we do. I don't know. I could be wrong on this. Actually, I think I am wrong. I think loop needs to be active, but I just want to test it. Oh, man. I just did the wrong one. I did creatures. That's OK. Whatever. I meant to do player characters. The creatures, they don't exist yet anyway, but uh, they use the same state machine. And uh, the state machine, I, I plan on keeping it the same just because the logic of the state machine will change. But I'll be able to use the animator override controller to, um, to override the animations and have it work uh, differently. So Hellcandy, when you transition from one animation to another, there's a duration in the transition between that. Yeah, there is a brief duration, but those durations, uh, let me just test this real quick. So I want to see if this could potentially be the culprit. I don't think it is. I think I'm going to have to undo all of that. No, it's still doing the same. Yeah, but now I broke the animation. Look at this. Now he's gliding, right? Because it doesn't loop. So it plays through once, and then it stops. OK, that was an exercise in me being silly. So I do want loop time on all of these. I really wish you could set all of them at the same time. So now I have to <laughs> recheck all of these checkboxes again. That's OK. So that gives me a few minutes to think about, OK, what else can I try? Now, the, the duration that you mentioned, Hell Candy, uh, between one animation to another, I have that disabled. I have it disabled, uh, and I always have it disabled, so it immediately changes from one animation to another instantly within that exact frame. So it, it, there is zero delay in between one animation to the next, but I will recheck that just to make sure. OK, so we'll go back to the animator. I'll select my model. OK, so we'll go into settings. Wait, it's a blend tree. Yeah, so has exit time, duration, all of those are disabled. Why is this one different than this one? But there's no there's no duration. Okay, if it's less than zero point zero 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 one, so if the value of uh, a movement or speed, should I say, is less than that value, it'll go from movement to idle. Could that be it? I don't think so. It's weird how there's this here, but on the other direction, that's not there. I find that strange. 
I guess one is because it goes into a blend tree, one is coming out of a blend tree. I'm not sure. Maybe the walking extends before going back to idle. I'm not sure what you mean. Could you elaborate on that a bit? I think it's my code logic because I, I don't see any flaws here. This is very simplistic. I think it's my code. I think there's a condition I'm missing. So let's look at this again. Uh, for activating the animation, the animations, it works well. It works really well. But it's the stopping it that doesn't work. So let's let's first check that. Okay. So right now it's in the idle. It's playing the idle animation. Okay. And then I go to movement. Okay, so it's playing the movement animation longer than it should. You can see this progress bar building out. That should be instant because I'm just tapping, right? I'm tapping and letting go. It takes like less than a tenth of a second for me to tap a button and let go. But look at how much of the movement animation it's playing, right? Whereas if you see the idle going from idle out, and when I go from one to the other, Okay, so it's likely um, my logic somewhere. Because there's no reason why when you tap and let go, this should play for that long. But where would it be in my logic though? Because it's really not complex. So I I'm overlooking something. So where's all my returns? Okay, so that'll exit out of that condition. That'll exit if it's that condition. And then this will exit on the stop. If is user controlled equals false, it exits. If allow input is false, it exits. Otherwise, it gets all the inputs. If any of these provide a value and they're all vector twos, then it will take that and it will compare them to the previous iteration. If it equals to the previous iteration, which it may not equal to the previous iteration, I think this might be it right here. Yeah, I think that's the flaw right there. Because I don't care about the previous iteration. I care about the current one. So what I'll do is I'll say if underscore input movement current equals vector 2.0, meaning there's no input. If there's no input, animator, stop animating. Right? And then this can be, for whatever reason I did that before, I'll leave that as is. I 
because I don't need this logic to be nested in a comparison between the current frame value versus the previous frame value. Yeah, perfect. That's it. That was exactly it. Okay, so you can see by me tapping, look at the movement. That's how much time it takes uh, for me to press and release. It's instant, right? And that solves it. Yeah. So that was it. So that's one of it, one of the challenges. The other is that when I let go, even though I'm holding right and I'm letting go, it still goes to the down animation or the down idle, should I say. And I don't want that. I want it to stay at the previous spacing direction, whatever that may be. So the reason why that's happening is because I'm setting horizontal and vertical to zero. So if I don't set horizontal and vertical to zero, but I set speed to zero, that means it should stop and then whatever the previous values of horizontal or vertical were should remain. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That was it. And that's exactly it. So if I'm facing left, I'm walking left. Okay, that's it. Okay, now before I break it anymore, I just want to test it in the game room just to see that it is working. So I'm going to disable that. We'll go back to the uh, loading scene. So I want to log in. So we'll say scene, uh, loading scene. Grab my controller. Yeah, that's much better. Having directional movement even though I'm still getting stuck on those invisible corners, having directional movement is so much better. It just feels so much better to be able to move around. I like that. Yeah, it's good. Nice. Yeah, thanks. We got it. And you know, these things, I, I didn't think I was going to get stuck on something so simple for so long. Looks good. So that's the stealth ninja costume. Um, not exactly. If you recall, that is the uh, the default one when your character model is loading. And oftentimes the load is so fast, you never see it. But for anyone who experienced latency or internet connection issues, uh, and they were unable to get a stable connection to the server and an unstable connection to the uh, CDN, the content delivery network, which would load the graphical assets because everything gets loaded individually, um, you would see this instead if it failed loading. It would continuously keep trying to load, but um, it would fail. All right, so now let's go break some stuff. All right, so we'll go back to the prefab um, animations. Animations? Yeah. Yeah, I want to remove all of those extra sprites 
that huge list and I want to use the new ones that I just brought in earlier today. That's what I want to do. And it's starting to get, oh, it's starting to get uh, end of night. Usually I would have uh, cut the stream, but I want to do this one last thing before I call it a night. So let's, uh, let's try to do that. Hopefully without breaking too many things, but um, this will break some of the animations in the other areas in the old um, prototype. Because in the prototype, if you used it before, um, I had the world uh, kind of like a, a segment of a world. I just pieced it together. It wasn't connected to the server. There was no synchronization. There's no multiplayer. There's no nothing. But it was just basically moving around with an environment and a camera that followed you uh, very smoothly because it was the Cinemachine camera. So that's going to break, but that's okay. I'm totally fine with breaking that part of it because it's all being rebuilt and that old stuff is going to be removed eventually when I do a proper cleanup. Okay, so we'll go into the model. I want to select the model. I want to select the animator. Okay. So idle down is going to be the new version. Because later on, when these sprites get replaced, the graphics will just get replaced. But um, all of this logic, all this work that's in here now, it'll get preserved. OK, so down was 1. So we'll replace that. Left was right, uh, left, okay. And then idle right was that one. Okay, and then idle up, I believe was the third one. Okay. So that's our idle. And then the walk. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete all of these because they're not needed. This one is walk down. I guess I'll just do the other one too. So let's just look at all those animations. Each one of those is a sprite. That's way too many. Okay, so walk down will be walk down will be this one. You can just drag and drop it, which is nice. And then I'll change the sample rate afterwards. Or actually, I could test it now. <laughs> yeah. See, you see that jitter that's happening? That's because of the anchor position. Remember how I said uh, when Flash exports, the anchor position is, uh, is not coming in correct? Because of that, you get this jitter, right? Of course, when I change the sample rate, um, it'll be different. So we'll change the sample rate down to, I think it was six frames, right? So it's, it's not as noticeable, but it still is, right? And you can still see it kind of wobbling around a little bit when the head should actually be perfectly stationary. The head doesn't move in the animation, right? But that's because of the flash export. So I'll need to, Fix that later, but I, I don't care about it right now. So we'll go with sample rate of six. No, sample rate should be 10. I think, whatever. Sample rate is easy to fix. Okay, so that's our down. Left will be, of course, the left.
Okay, and we'll set sample rate to 10. And then same thing for the right. And then we'll change sample rate to 10. Sample rate means how fast the animation is playing to simplify it, right? So you could have a fast animation and you can reduce the speed of it. And the good thing is though, all of this uses the core functionality of Unity, which is animation is time-based. So even if you're doing time uh, dot delta time, it all still works uh, really well in my opinion. Okay, so that should be our animations. Meaning if I go up to this directory, images character default, Oh, those animations should not be there. Okay, I will just delete the sprites. Let's make sure they're sprites. Uh, actually, how can I do this? Because I want to move that from animations into here. Let's Let's actually do that first. So animations, I'll right click, uh, create a folder. I will call it uh, character zero models, character model zero. Okay. And then I want to move those animations because I want to preserve them. So that's one of them. Another one, should be two more. Oh, right, there's the idle ones as well, of course. So I'm just preserving it because I'm going to delete this whole folder. And that'll result in all of those uh, sprites being removed from the sprite atlas. So that'll save a lot of space. Okay, looks good. So what I'll do is I'll just go here, default, delete, bye-bye. Okay, so that'll break some stuff, but that's okay. The whatever stuff that's broken is uh, non-critical. But what I need to do is I need to test this. I also want to have a look at my Sprite Atlas. It should be a lot smaller now. Right-click on it and no. Pack preview. So that just forces it to rebuild, I think. Yeah, much better, right? Like, check this out. Look at how much extra space I got from removing all of those sprite animations of the walk animations. That's a lot more space now, right? And then later, I'll. I'll I'll move some of these other ones too, of course. I'll restructure it. Currently, I only have one atlas for the whole thing. Later, I'll I'll break them out. Like uh, GUI navigation will be different than, let's say, characters and pets and all that kind of stuff. Right now, everything's just mixed in. I'm okay with that because it's just pointed to a directory, but that still frees up a lot of space. And then you can also see the pets, the pet animation, also same thing that can be reduced significantly. All those blue dots you see, all those uh, pet animations, that can be uh, significantly improved as well. Okay, now I just wanna test it just to make sure that it is still working and I didn't break that part of it. So we'll go back to the uh, scene loading, save everything, and then let's run it and see. Oh, I got the password wrong. How do I get that password wrong? It's literally password.
Okay. Waiting. Waiting. Yep. Hmm. I, I totally noticed that jitter of the character moving. You can see he's he's walking to the right, and I'm intentionally walking against the wall, and you can see that jumping up and down. Right? Like. Right? So if I'm moving down, like look at that jitter. It, it's like a bobble head, right? It, it, the bobble heads that you put in your car where it's like, right? That That's kind of what it looks like to me. But that's okay. All of these things can be cleaned up later. The logic is there. So that means the next thing that I can do is I can do the KO, which I know you're looking forward to, right? So that'll be the next thing, but it is pretty much end of night for me. I still got a couple of things to clean up before I call it a night, and I got to be up early tomorrow morning as usual for work. But I think that was pretty good. So this will likely be a two-parter or maybe even a three-parter, depending on how the KO animation goes, because the KO logic doesn't exist. I need to actually code that, the arc of getting flung in all directions as well as adding that into the state machine so that that can be used as well. And I'll need to, oh yeah. I need to also export a KO uh, frame that can be used for an animation. So then I can, uh, I can mathematically, mathematically uh, angulate the trajectory of it and the rotation. Okay, but I think that went pretty well, you know. Uh, sure, there was, there was a few mistakes, but that's, you know, that's all part of the whole development process. That's what makes it interesting. It's about learning. It's about having a little bit of fun. It's about making mistakes, learning from it. And then you, you end up with a uh, desired outcome in the end that you're happy with. And, uh, you know, and you move on to the next task. And as you keep building up all of these different pieces of it, the puzzle slowly starts to come together. And before you know it, you have this really, uh, you know, awesome whatever it is that you're making. And, uh, you know, it, it looks pretty good. Like, you know, if you compare this to what I started with initially with the Unity client, uh, there really wasn't there to start with. But, you know, over time, and I've been broadcasting this and the videos are on YouTube, you can see the pieces progressively ever so, you know, all these little steps, every step gets you a little bit closer to where you want it to be. And there's going to be some uh, really interesting stuff that we'll be able to do with the power of the GPU at our disposal versus before with Flash, which was entirely on the CPU and it was very limited resources at best. Anyway, uh, I think that's gonna be it for today. Um, I hope you uh, learned something or got some entertainment value out of it. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm happy to share this with you. You know, if you get entertainment out of it, please let me know. And if you missed anything, feel free to watch the uh, YouTube videos. This will likely end up on YouTube sometime uh, early to mid this week. And then the rest of the videos, of course, following. Uh, I am fully caught up on the YouTube videos. So any of those that you want to see, they're at your discretion and at your convenience. Um, that's going to be it for today. Um, and yeah, so the next thing I will be doing on the next video is I will do likely the KO animation and then move on from there. Unless something else comes up, but we'll see. But my next stream is going to be Friday. I do stream every uh, Monday, Friday, sorry, every Tuesday, Friday, Saturday. Um, and if you miss my streams, they're always available on um YouTube sometime later, if you like, and if you haven't done so already for the viewers that are watching, 
please uh, join the Discord channel, join the community. It's a small community, but it's a special community. And they're all people who support or have been playing Project CSK for some time. And they're looking forward to the new version as we all are, especially me more than anyone else to enjoy uh, what it's going to be. And it's gonna be really cool. Uh, but that's gonna be it for today. So uh, thank you for watching. Uh, hope you have a great day and maybe I'll see you next time. Bye.